Good afternoon, and to those people at home, hello. You're over there. I'm Dr. Witzit. Today is uh, the afternoon physician lecture at 4 o'clock, and welcome, everybody. Any family members here today? I see a few people. Yeah, thank you so much for being here to support your concern for the people that you care about. And uh, I'm the medical director. I've been here going on a little over seven years plus, and um, I'm board certified in addiction and internal medicine. I'm not a psychiatrist. We have a board certified psychiatrist on staff to see everybody. And um, we are um, glad that you're here for today's lecture. So if you have questions during the lecture, shout it out. You know, this is about learning. This is about education. Trying to understand what I consider to be a difficult, if not baffling illness. And so let's uh, kind of dig into this because I do have a lot of stuff I want to talk about today. Um, we do the Tuesday 4 o'clock lecture series and then uh, the second and fourth Saturdays of every month, the physician gives a lecture at 10 o'clock. The first Saturday of every month is alumni weekend. And um, the third one, uh, I mean the fourth one, I don't know what they do. I'm not here. Uh, I like to start the lectures off by something light and frivolous before we get into the heavy stuff. So let's see what about, yes, since I was here, I was on vacation last week and uh, doing continuing medical education. Uh, it looks like Avalanche won the Stanley Cup, right? And uh, the Reds haven't changed. They're still in the basement, if you follow the Reds. I love my team, but oh my gosh. And of course, for me, it's an exciting thing because this past Friday, the Tour de France started. I was there in 2018 and saw four or five of the different stages. But um, my wife and I met on a bicycle, and uh, I think we're going to ride into the sunset as we get older. We are Tour de France nuts, so we really enjoy watching it. And she's also into dogs and likes to rescue dogs. And, you know, she would have 20 if she had her way. But I got her from five down to three at this point. Uh, this is a neglected dog, but look at that. Happy dog now, right? Wow. This is what happens. You got a happy dog. What a mess that was. And I have a friend out in San Diego. She's an internist. She's retired now. And um, she said that the San Diego Zoo a few years ago, they got a new white rare rhino. Wallace, and, but he was moping around for about two or three weeks. They couldn't figure out. So one of the uh, keepers brought in a metal detector and lo and behold, discovered the bullet. And they took the bullet out of Wallace and now Wallace is a happy guy and walking around and feeling really good. But everyone's looking at him like, why did you bring in a metal detector for? He goes, I have a hunch. And sure enough, found the bullet that was re remaining. This is why women do not leave your children or our children with us because we are scary dads. And this is a scary dad moment when you come home and you see your kid looking like a biker and like Mario, Mario. And uh, we also see our children looking like Pizza the Hut. And you're like, really? Is that what you did to me, dad, when I was a little baby? Yes, that's what I did to you. And of course, there's Bugsy. This is my favorite because Bugsy will forever remember how Minnie Mouse was on his diaper as a tough guy. And there it is. So. And lastly, this is a commercial from long ago. This is actually in the 90s, but it's still one of my favorite. If you've seen it. Hello. Honey? Are you at the club? Yes. <laughs> I got the mall now. I found this beautiful leather coat. It's only a thousand. Can I get it? Well, sure, if you like it that much. Okay, um, I also stopped by the Mercedes dealership and found a new model. You know what? Really How much? 120. Well, at that price, I wanted to look at all the options. Great. Oh, and, and one more thing the house we won last year is back on the market. They're, they're asking 1.5. I'll make them an offer. But come in at uh, 1.4. So hopefully uh, you don't find yourself in a financial predicament like that. Uh, totally embarrassing if you do. All right, well let's uh, get off of this and we're going backwards, but that's nothing new here. And we're gonna see if we can get back on page. There we go. A reminder to everyone, this is a confidential get together. Who you see, what you hear should stay in the room. Please don't take pictures or take gossip out of the room. Don't post on Facebook or another social media site that you saw somebody that you know. Um, so we do uh, you know, expect and appreciate your confidentiality with regards 
to what is being said in the room today. And that's the same for everyone at home too, please. Thank you. I want to take a moment to talk to the families. Um, you are probably suffering from some codependency issues. Codependency occurs when you have an overly emotional reliance or investment in someone that is struggling with chemical dependency. And so this is a normal phenomenon, but it can become pathologic and it can interfere with the recovery of our patients. Some of the feelings from a codependent, and I'm a codependent because I have a couple of family members. One is recently newly recovered from alcoholism, and um, I'm still dealing with some of those codependency issues, and one's still active in their addiction. Um, and I have a lot of anger. Um, some people experience shame, lack of trust, a lot of anxiety, maybe depression. So for family members, we really respect and appreciate how difficult this can be because it's the family that experiences the aberrant behavior of the sick patient. It's the family that has to watch it and struggle with it and then deal with, I call it the mop-up crew. And so we know how difficult it can be as a family member. We appreciate that. And it says view, and I'm trying to let them in. Dave is not here. And I don't think I have permission to, I don't have permission to let you in, I'm so sorry. This is a reading list. If you have a need for this, I have printed out some of that material and can provide it in the back of the room. This has been vetted by our previous family members as well as our staff, it can be helpful to get a book, download it onto your Kindle or your iPad, and maybe take a little bit of time to do some reading about addiction and learn about it because it is deep and it's complicated. Of course, our staff, uh, Mary Jo, we love Mary Jo. She met with our clients this afternoon to do discharge coordination. She is all in for recovery. She is passionate about recovery. Feel free to reach out to Mary Jo if you have any concerns or questions. And as a reminder to the people that are family members, I like this. You cannot heal people that you love. You can't make their choices and you can't rescue them. You can promise that they won't journey alone and you can loan them your map, but it's their trip. And I think that's very important because a lot of me wants to take my sick family members that are still drinking and using drugs and I want to slap them on the side of the head and say, just stop it, please, quit drinking. It doesn't work that way. And so if you have these kinds of issues as a codependent, take the time to learn about it. I can't let them in, Dave, if you can do that. Thank you. And to the people that are here at the Ridge, we're glad you're here. You've taken a big step to saying, I need help. I want to get help. Let me learn about it. Being sick sucks. I like the way that rolls off my tongue. It sucks. No one likes having cancer. No one likes having diabetes, hypertension, asthma. Having an addictive illness, whether it's alcohol use disorder, cocaine use disorder, cannabis use disorder, stimulant use disorder, whatever it is, it's not fun. It can be difficult. It's a medical problem. I'm a big believer in this. I believe this has to do with changes in our brain that lead to this compulsive behavior. And why is it that someone continues to drink or do drugs despite having serious adverse consequences? It's a medical problem. That's my opinion. I have a lot of pushback from other people and some other doctors even think it's just an aberrant behavior that has no biological basis. However, I've got good data and studies to show that it is a biologically based brain disorder. We're not gonna get into that in a deep dive today. But I'd say to the patient, Many of you are here because you have maybe medical problems or legal problems, most with family problems, financial problems, business problems, whatever. I just want to tell you it's not your fault that you're sick. And I think that's an important message. I'm not getting you off the hook entirely, but no one gets COVID on purpose, right? No one gets the flu on purpose. Nobody gets sick with addiction intentionally. It's not your fault that you have it. But you have it if you're here. And so hopefully you'll be willing to deal with it. 
If you are struggling with a diagnosis of alcohol use disorder, etc., the answer is in your court. I can't make you sober. Your loved ones can't make you quit using. It's up to you to figure this out. Because most people go, what's the big deal? Just quit drinking. Just quit using your Coke. It's a big deal. If you're an addict, alcoholic, it's a big deal. It's difficult. And we know that. And we give you roadmaps to figuring out how to stop. But it is ultimately up to the client, to the patient, to figure it out. But it can be done. Know that there is great hope. The science of addiction, I've been doing medicine for over 40 years. And what I've learned is how much more information we have today supporting the notion not only that this is a genetically driven disease, and I actually knew that a long time ago, but we've also been able to show that there are epigenetics and developmental influences, that how our environment can shape and mold someone. I believe people are locked and loaded to be an alcoholic or an addict, and that through certain circumstances and stresses and traumas, in some people, not everyone, that can be not only unlocked, but it can be given off. And then the development of the disease, if you will, can occur. Mental disorders, I think Dr. Soto talked about how there's co-occurring disorders. Most, not all, but most peop people that struggle with a use disorder have some type of co-occurring, particularly anxiety and depression. Those are the things that we see by far the most. Of course, now I want to remind you, I treat substance use disorders, and I believe that it's a chronic brain illness. I'm a big believer in the 12-step model. I love AA and NA. It is not the only thing available. There's smart recovery. There's faith-based recovery, Buddhist for recovery. I don't really care, but I will advise everyone to be considering to be involved in some type of self-help group when they leave here. If you think you can just go home and I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to use my Coke, I'm not going to smoke my pot, most people without other social networking support are failures. I love the step eight and nine in the AA 12-step program because it's to me the healing phase of saying I am sorry to my family and I'm going to make amends. And I think that's an important thing to be done, maybe not right away, but eventually steps eight and nine I think are very important. I think it is critical for family healing. Now if you're new to us, when you come in this week, we will not see you in treatment team, but if you came in last week, we will see you for the first time in treatment team on Thursday. When in treatment team, we will ask you to recite by memory the two flips. It is in your handout, I am reminding you Please memorize that. Right, Greg? Yes, sir. Thank you. So this is the two flips. It's an eight-item acronym of the pertinent features of any use disorder. It doesn't matter what the drug is, and I consider alcohol to be a drug, and it doesn't matter how much you drink or do. It doesn't say if you drink a six-pack a day, you're an alcoholic. It doesn't say if you do two lines of Coke a day, you are or not. It talks about the consequences. Let's go through them briefly. T stands for tolerance, W for withdrawal, U is used despite negative consequences, F is failed attempts to cut back or quit, L is loss of control, I is isolation, P is preoccupation, and S is secret keeping. So please take the time. It is in your handout binder, and if you need help with it, I'm sure some of the peers that have been here a little longer will help you with it. Please don't embarrass yourself. When you come into treatment team, I don't know how you did last week. I hope you all did well. But we will ask you to recite this with every treatment team that you're in. Today I want to kind of dive into acute alcohol use with alcohol use disorder. I want to talk about binge drinking, prenatal use of alcohol, drunk driving, some of the um, toxicologic effects of alcohol. So let's do this because I do have a lot, like I said, I want to cover. How do you tell if someone has a drinking problem? Well, it's not always easy because by far, July 4th is one of the heaviest drinking weekends. July 4th is a heavy drinking weekend. My neighbors were all lit. I mean, do they all have a use disorder? I have no idea. 
I don't interact with them that often. I know they were <coughs> drunk on Sunday night. Not my business, but they were. So how do you tell if someone has a drinking problem? It's not always easy. It is the most commonly used addictive substance. We're not looking at nicotine, which is probably more addictive and more prevalent. Or, you know, we don't treat that here. Um, but it does cause a lot of people, not everyone, but a lot of people severe harm. I believe genetics plays about a 70% role. Studies support maybe 60, 40. But there's no doubt when you look at family trail, it's there genetically. Binge drinking is a problem in the United States. It's a big problem. Um, a lot of people do it. It doesn't mean you are an alcoholic if you're a binge drinker. We talk about heavy drinking. For a man, more than two drinks a day, and for a woman, more than one drink a day. That's heavy drinking. It's de defined by the National Council on Alcoholism. But binge drinking means getting so drunk you get to a .08. You drink to get drunk. We use a cage screening instrument to help guide us if someone is having a problem. Here at our facility, it's pretty easy because family members call us, the patients call us and say, I got a problem. But in a regular primary care practice, most patients, as I've talked about in the past, they don't admit to having a problem and their family's embarrassed to bring it up. So we ask these kinds of questions, such as an alcohol screening cage questionnaire. Alcohol goes way back. We have records now from 9,000 BC showing that the Chinese were making the brew. They were into wine and beer a long time ago. It has been around forever. So people have liked getting buzzed for a long time. Ethanol or ethyl alcohol, it's a solvent. It's made by fermenting organic material. Um, you can add yeast to it to kind of speed up the process. Um, there's the breweries back in Sumerian times, Egyptian times. And we also know, uh-oh, that's getting weird on me. Come on, you can move, there we go. That in Italy in the mid-13, uh, 1200s, they came up with a thing called distilling, where you would take the product and heat it, vaporize it, collect the vaporized material and do it over and over again and you would concentrate the alcohol. And back then it was great for bald people. They used it to cure baldness. Actually, that didn't work. And they found that it does kill fleas and lice, but not very well. And uh, today it holds true. It gives young person courage, stupid courage, because that is something very common when people get really intoxicated, they do stupid stuff. I'm Scottish by my heritage. Um, you know, we're the, the white side family. And um, boy, we're big into that copper vask, uh, making the whiskey over there. A lot of beer and stuff brought over during the Puritans when they came over on the boats. That's how they recruited people to get on a boat. Who wants to go on a three to four month voyage and maybe die? I'll do it as long as you give me a lot of beer, sold and they would provide beer. Beer was preferred over water because water gave everyone diarrhea. Beer did not. By the early 1800s, alcoholism was epidemic here in America. Farmers all drank hard cider when they would wake up in the morning. Their kids would drink it and go out milk cows and work. It was everywhere. Most families had problems. There were many, many families without fathers because they died in their 40s from cirrhosis. That started the temperance movement in the 1800s and it led to prohibition. It finally ended in prohibition. That was finally ended. And today we still use it medically. I worked on a Native American reservation back in 1980s and occasionally we would actually use an alcohol drip on people to detox them off alcohol because we didn't have medication sufficient to, to take people off of alcohol and detox. We still use it at the hospital for ethylene glycol poisoning and for methanol poisoning, which are the two most common poisonings that we see. However, ethanol is still used widely as a solvent in medicinals, and it's in a lot of mouthwashes. Check your mouthwash, because alcohol is used there, and some patients drink their mouthwash to get drunk. The largest single use of ethanol, of course, is in our gasoline. It's a fuel additive. Um, of course, gasoline's crazy right now. I can't even talk about it. What's fascinating as a physician, how many different ways there are to take alcohol. You can vape alcohol. Who does that? I don't know, but there it is, vape shot. People vape it. Um, you can use it as a mist, put it in a balloon and mist it. This is crazy stuff. Oh yeah, 
You can go into a, a, a mist room, put on a bathing suit and allow the mist to land on your skin and you sit there and over 30 minutes, you get intoxicated with the mist. They charge for that in London. Who does that? Oh, in London they do. Powdered alcohol, it's been banned in Ohio. You go in to a ball game and you've got your little powder, add a little water, shake it up and you got alcohol. Palcohol, it's banned in Ohio, however, don't, don't do it. These are the states where it's been banned and where it's allowed. Uh, Kentucky, I think, is still dealing with it. I don't think they've out outlawed it. Yes, some women use it in tampons. You can get tampons soaked with alcohol to get buzzed. Oh yeah, you can get pretty drunk, by the way. Uh, this is not for sale to men. And uh, yeah, it's amazing what people do to hide their drinking. And now you can buy these leak-proof hidden flasks. I mean, this is sad. My daughter works over at Christ Hospital, and this weekend she said, she came in and there's a patient with a beer sitting on his mother's little tray. And she goes, what are you doing? He goes, well, I didn't figure it would be help me to hide it, so I just brought it in. She goes, well, you can't drink in here. So yeah, most people do hide it and they buy these little things off Amazon. That's called butt chugging. It's ancient. A woman was charged in Texas about 10 years now because she killed her husband, giving him an enema with uh, alcohol, beer. So butt chugging is very dangerous. There's no protective factor because the alcohol gets rapidly absorbed uh, in the anal cavity. So we do see this occasionally. And the latest stupid thing on TikTok is eyeballing, where people put <coughs> vodka bottles up to their eyeball and uh, they think they can actually get intoxicated. All it does is cause corneal damage, which is just so crazy, but they think it's cool. Most people drink it, thank you. That's probably the normal way to take alcohol. What about the effects of alcohol? I'm a chemist. I studied chemistry in uh, college. Um, chemistry to me is fascinating. Um, ethanol is a great solvent. We use it all the time. It's volatile. It's flammable as well. When we drink it, some of it is absorbed in the mouth. It goes through the esophagus, down the esophagus. A little bit's absorbed there. It goes into the stomach where the stomach will delay the absorption if there are, is food or fat in the stomach. It delays the, the absorption. Most will peak in 30 to 90 minutes after it's consumed. It then goes on to the small intestine where additionally it'll get absorbed. About 10% comes out of our urine or our breath or our sweat. Most, 90% of it, is metabolized by our liver. And of course at my last lecture we talked about cirrhosis and how the liver is the uh, clearinghouse for alcohol. So a little bit goes into the urine. We do not test your urine generally for alcohol. We do test it for a metabolite on a urine drug screen called ethyl sulfate. Um, but most of the time we don't test it directly for ethanol. This is uh, a Sears and Roebuck ad from the 30s and that is called a, uh, um, a drunk -a meter exhalation device. And the women would buy this because they wanted to see if their husbands were drunk when they would come home on Tuesday night and they were late. And the husband would say, I only had two. And she would make him blow into the device. And of course, it would turn color because it was a litmus test. And uh, she would say, see, I told you you were drunk. And of course, she didn't really need that because he would be stumbling and slurring his words. And she knew that, but it was proof. Um, Professor Hargo here at um, IU developed the Drunkometer, and it was a device that was eventually turned into, of course, the breathalyzer. We use breathalyzers here. Um, we do not use it for any legal purpose. It is for clinical guidance only. So we never would allow police to know the results of this. If a patient shows up here for an outpatient assessment, this happens actually a lot, um, they come here, they drive themselves here, we check their breathalyzer, they might be 0.16, and we're like, wow, you drove here, we do not want you to drive home. But legally, we're not allowed to detain them, and all we can do is call the sheriff, we try to get them an Uber home or a family member to come pick them up. Now, as a doctor, this is an important number. I know that you, when you drink, can metabolize one drink an hour. I don't care how big or little you are. One drink an hour is what the average person can metabolize in one hour. Well, what's a drink? A drink in the United States is 12 ounces of regular beer, not IPA, 
five ounces of regular wine or one and a half ounces of hard liquor. That's a drink. You can metabolize one of those an hour. When you consume more than that in that time period, your blood alcohol then goes up. Now you're going, oh, Dr. Witzer, what are you doing? Well, let me just explain to you. On the left is alcohol. You drink it, it's absorbed, and then it turns into, it's metabolized by an enzyme into a thing called acetaldehyde, which sounds a lot like formaldehyde, which I think most of you recognize is not very good. And it's quickly metabolized then into acetate, and acetate is vinegar. And the body is okay with vinegar because it can take vinegar and make it into CO2 and H2O, and you urinate it out. The thing is, some people can't do it. Now, let me show you. If you go to bed at 2 a.m. and you're at 0 0.20, when you wake up at 8 a.m., you're still at 0 0.11 and you're at work. It doesn't, it's 14 hours later before you go to zero. So just remember, if you're getting really hammered on a Sunday night and you have to go to work on Monday, it could take 12 to 16 hours for that blood alcohol level to come down. And there it is. 2 to 8 a.m., you're still drunk when you go to work. Now, some people, particularly Asians, have an alcohol flush reaction. Now, I talked about how alcohol goes to that acetaldehyde. Some people cannot metabolize it from acetaldehyde to vinegar, and they get this flush reaction. You can't see it real well, but see how red his face is? But let me show you this. Not that, but let me show you this. This is a woman that has the flush reaction. I don't know if anyone else struggles with this, but this is me after having my first and only drink. This is an insane. This is after having one vodka cranberry. She's allergic to alcohol, so some people are allergic to it because they can't metabolize it. And by the way, if you've heard of the drug Anabuse, this is what Anabuse does. Anabuse blocks the conversion from acetaldehyde to vinegar, and you get that reaction. And if you drink on Anabuse, you can die, because I've had a patient die from drinking on it. So I think most of us know how it makes us feel. We get warmth. We get flushed a little bit. Our words get slurred. It makes us urinate more. It suppresses a hormone called ADH, so we go to the bathroom more. It also impacts our heart. Studies are showing that the heart doesn't beat as strongly or as well, and it's much more prone to atrial fibrillation. And people think, well, I need alcohol just to go to sleep. The problem is it's crappy sleep. When you drink alcohol to go to sleep, you never get into those deep restorative stages of sleep that we need to heal our brain. Well, the stomach gets really beat up with this because a lot of people are taking ibuprofen, Advil, because they're going to have a hangover. So they'll slug down the Advil in the morning. They've already put a bunch of beer, wine, whatever into their stomach, which erodes away the protective lining of the stomach already. So a lot of people get problems with reflux, ulcers, and sometimes they end up with bleeding. I talked about the liver also last time, how it can be overwhelmed, particularly in people that drink heavily over a long period of time. And of course, cirrhosis is that end game, and we're not going to talk about that today. Alcohol impairs our brain function totally. It uh, affects our motor skills, our hand-eye coordination, our balance, our speech. And I like this TikToker because he talks about... New research has found if you drink this once a day, you are both decreasing your brain size and accelerating aging. If you guess alcohol, you are correct. The study was done on 36,000 people and found that even if you increase your alcohol intake by half a glass a day, you would increase and accelerate the aging by two years and also decrease your brain size. So decreasing your alcohol intake is a great way to both retain the size of your brain and slow down the process of aging. I mean, like I've said last lecture, nobody that I know of has been drinking heavily over years has come to me and said, my IQ has gone up, Dr. Witsit, because of my drinking. You don't get smarter with heavy drinking. It doesn't happen. So let's talk about the binging. Who's that? What happened to Amy? Huh? 
From what? Which drug? It was. I mean, when she died, I, remember, I looked at my wife and I said, heroin. So I said, I said, heroin overdose. Whoa, I was wrong. She died of alcohol poisoning. That's so tragic. Yeah, it's crazy. So we know that hangovers occur. We know that they can last up to 24 hours, actually. Um, it intensifies other drugs. A lot of people like to do coke and drink. A lot of people like to use pot and drink. But a binge is getting to drunk, 0.08. That's what a binge is considered medically. So if you drink enough to get there, it's usually about three to four drinks. We consider a binge in a gentleman to be about five drinks. But if you're drinking to get drunk, that's a binge episode. And again, size does make a difference because if you're smaller, it takes less to get you. I mean, I think Andre the Giant consumed like, I, did I read something like 30 beers in two hours or something? It's just enormous, but he was ginormous. He was also an alcoholic, so it was horrible. I talked about this, 14 drinks in a typical week for a man is considered right on the cusp of high risk drinking patterns or heavy drinking. Women, you get one a day. So that's a problem. I think the women are shortchanged a little bit, but that is what it is. When you see these kinds of events, I think it's pretty obvious there's a problem here. This is not cool behavior. It can be dangerous and risky behavior. Fights, I worked in an emergency room for 15 years. Friday and Saturday nights got crazy. And the stuff that we saw, I can't even describe it. This is why you don't want to pass out and get wrapped to a tree because now, this is 12 years ago, this kid was wrapped to that tree and now he's in my lecture in 2022. It's on the internet forever. And you know what, when you apply for a job, people are gonna look for it. When we hire new people, we go and look at social media and for images of what has happened to you. Well, there it is, hangover, thirst, headache, photophobia where light is irritating, sounds, hyperacusis where sounds bother you. Um, it's a horrible thing. Some people get so drunk they have blackouts where they don't remember parts of the day or the evening. It clearly impairs our driving and motor skills. People get very aggressive. We talk about the Jekyll Hyde syndrome with alcoholism. About 15% of heavy drinkers, men particularly, are Jekyll Hyde. Their personality changes and they become aggressive and angry and combative and can hurt people and destroy property. So, and just as an aside, gentlemen, you think you're a better guy in bed, you're really not because studies have shown the sexual performance is actually worse. I like this, and you probably don't care, but it tells me if someone comes in and their blood alcohol level is at 0.08, it tells me it takes about five and a third hours for it to go to zero. So we can actually calculate when someone comes in and we measure their breathalyzer, how long it's gonna take before they go down to zero. Because I don't want people to be going up into the Stuckert house, particularly if they're still under the influence. Well, how much can someone drink? There's that one ounce and a half of liquor, one standard drink in one hour. And if you drink more than that, the blood alcohol level starts to go up. Alcohol poisoning is when you drink so much with a binge drink that you become unconscious, non-arousable. Let's talk about this. When your blood alcohol gets to around 0.15, that's almost two times legal, people start to stumble, they have difficulty with walking, they might be vomiting, they get to 0.2, which is two and a half times legal, they might need help walking, they're very sick usually if they're not heavy drinkers regularly. Almost everyone at this level will have a blackout. At 0.25, you're starting to getting into the Jimi Hendrix zone. Jimi Hendrix died from alcohol poisoning. He died after he threw up and aspirated his vomit when he was drunk. Such a waste. You get to 0 0.30, 0 0.35, you're really hammered. This is dangerous stuff. Most are passed out. This is anesthetic level. And when you get to 0.40 and above, almost always you're gonna end up in a hospital. Not always. We've had someone walk into the, our facility here at 0.42, and that was just recently. So people can build up a tolerance over time, but people that are virgin to alcohol with these levels, 
they're in a coma. And there's not much we can do about it. Six people a day in the United States die from alcohol poisoning, and someone is going to die during my lecture, likely. We know that hazing lawsuits are on the rise. This goes back to 2012 when a student was hazed. I was in a fraternity. We didn't do this stuff, but some are still doing it. And uh, killed them. Uh, 0.48. That's really bad. Worse than that, I think, I really think, is this kid. Just recently, last fall, they got to him, but they coded him, and he lived, and now he's blind. He can't move, but he's alive. And that, in the last two weeks, has hit the newsreel because there's all these lawsuits that are going on. His family's from Minnesota, and he was going to the University of Missouri when this happened. So this is tragic, and lots of people are going to jail for this, unfortunately. It's horrible. Oh, there's the admit thing. I can do that. Good. Well, how do you know if someone's experiencing alcohol poisoning? Confusion, vomiting, blue tinge to their skin, they're cool, they're pale, you can't arouse them. These are all signs that they're really under the influence of this poison, this depressant known as alcohol. What do we do in the hospital? Well, we can't do a lot. We monitor them. We give them an IV banana bag with vitamins in it. We try to ventilate them and support them. We give them oxygen, obviously, but there's not much we can do. They are not candidates for dialysis. We can't put them on ECMO. There's nothing we can do. And we just pray and wait, just like everybody else. It's ventilator support. We do not have an antidote. I have an antidote for Tylenol. You have Tylenol poisoning, I have an antidote, but I don't have an antidote for alcohol. Many are mixed drug overdoses, makes it complicated. So someone might be using other drugs like cocaine, fentanyl, using other drugs that might be laced with unknown substances. And when I was in college, uh, one of my classmates died because he got drunk in January. It was near Columbus, Ohio. And we found him the next day frozen dead on the tennis court. He had gotten drunk and it was like eight degrees and he passed out and we never found him and he died. So yeah, this does happen, it's horrible. What about drunk driving? I just read a study saying that in the past six months, people polled 28% of men admit to driving impaired. That's one out of three and ever 56% of men said they have driven impaired. It's scary. There's Ubers, there's Lyfts, and people still do it. Drunk driving is a, it's a catastrophe for everybody. It, it not only impacts the person that does this, but to the families. It's horrific. I can't think of anything. I've got two kids. I can't think of anything that would break my heart more as an addictionologist than someone <laughs> killing a family member from drunk driving. Well, let's listen to someone that talks about it. April the 1st, 2006. I was 22 years old, and I had gone out drinking with a group of friends. We went to a restaurant in the hometown that I was born and raised in. We had some drinks. We partied. We laughed. We talked. It was somebody's birthday. We were having a celebration. We then got into everybody's cars and went to this popular nightclub. Uh, I was with a guy at the time, we drank a little more, we flirted, we danced, um, had a good time from what I remember, and then it got to be 3 a.m., and it was time to go home, and everything I'm about to tell you at this point was either told to me, it was heard on the news by me, or it was read in the incident report. About five minutes down the road, I ended up hitting the car then I did a 360 in the middle of the road and crashed into the patio of a nightclub, another nightclub that was en route to my house. People were standing out on the porch waiting to go in, and at least eight people got hurt that night. One person died at the scene of the wreck. Another person died two days later in the hospital. I myself was declared dead at the scene of the wreck and the time of death was written on my arm. A tarp covered my car. 
and hours later, still at the scene of the wreck, a cop came over to see um, who I was. He reached his body through the window across my body to check my purse for my ID to see who I was. When he did, he brushed up against my knee and I gasped for breath, for air. <clears throat> he hollered out that I was alive and they loaded me up into the ambulance and I would stay in the hospital for a couple of days where I would inevitably find out what I had done, that I had not only hurt people, but that I had taken lives, that I was one of the top news stories in the state that I was living in and that my life at that point would be forever changed, as would so many other lives. They would forever be changed. And this was in South Carolina, and she spent eight years in prison. She was charged with enough counts to put her in prison for 90 years. She pled out to eight years in prison. But those people can't come back, and, you know, this is a real story. This can happen. And I've got a client that several years ago, this exact same thing happened. He killed his passenger doesn't remember any of it because he was so drunk he was in a blackout and is spending eight years himself in prison. I haven't been in touch with him. I don't know what's going on now. I just know that this can happen, please. It's the one thing I ask of anyone that drinks. Don't drive and drink ever, please. If you want to sit at home and get drunk, it's on you. I'm sorry for your family and you, but don't get behind a wheel and take the chance of hurting my family, my children, my wife, or killing me. I mean, if you kill me, I won't know, but you know, it's just, a, it's a horrible thing. And I know that a lot of people are guilty of this. It, you know, we need to get that message out to other people. Ava? Yeah, this is someone that didn't get killed by a drunk driver, but was maimed. So this is a horrible thing. What are you gonna do? This isn't right. So this is the message I'm trying to also get out. Please don't drive impaired, whether it's pot, alcohol, coke, fentanyl, whatever drug, don't do it. Let's talk about pregnancy because believe it or not, some women like to drink when they're pregnant. Any use medically can increase the risk of a birth defect. But what's crazy is around 10 to 15% of women still drink anyways. This is a brain on the top of a baby that had fetal alcohol syndrome that died from unrelated causes at one year of age. Next to it is a normal brain from a baby at one year of age. And you can see how the alcohol has prevented the baby's brain from growing. On the Indian reservation when I worked, I saw fetal alcohol syndrome every day. I saw children that I knew had it just by looking at them because they, they look different, they look funny. Um, and so their, their features are different. A lot of these would grow up to have intellectual difficulties and disabilities, a lot more criminal behavior in these individuals. And this is a typical fetal alcohol syndrome face, lowered ears, a widened philtrum, difficulty with a, uh, the thin upper lip, they just looked funny to us, and we knew that they had FAS. These are children with FAS of different severity, but they just looked odd. Some of them presented pretty well, but many of them were very disabled and did very poorly in school. So FAS is a real issue for moms that are drinking. They, have, they had the learning and memory disabilities, difficulty with communication, their vision can be impaired, and their hearing can be impaired. So in summary, and I think I'm on time, alcohol is a legal poison. I am not a teetotaler. My kids drink in my home. My wife and I choose not to, but my kids drink. I don't care. It is very sexy and socially acceptable. I get that. I know how the pressures are. I know how people will stare at you and question you. What do you mean you're not drinking? What do you want to drink? You're not going to drink? And they make it a big deal. You will be facing these things. Be prepared. What's your answer going to be? I like I'm a designated driver. And everyone leaves you alone after that. 
but it's very socially pressured today. Even with moderate drinking, alleged health benefits are very dubious. And again, you'll hear occasional medical stories about how drinking is good for your heart and good for your health, but really, it's not. We don't have much data to support that. And, in, and with my last lecture, you saw the litany of bad things that can happen over time to people that drink heavily. I'm big on counseling and treatment, cognitive behavioral therapy, your groups, working with a counselor. If you are leaving us and going into IOP or aftercare can be very helpful. I saw people in IOP today that have been discharged from the Ridge in the last three months. It's wonderful to see them. Many are doing so well. I am a big believer in a 12-step program. I am not only a 12-step program kind of guy. I like smart recovery. Whatever you choose to do, Reformers Unanimous, um, faith-based, it doesn't matter to me. Start your own group of recovery and call it um, Shakespeare in the Park Naked. I don't care. But do something for yourself that involves other people that know who you are and have the same interest in not drinking and being sober. I'm not talking today about medications, but there are medications to assist, particularly naltrexone and Vivitrol. Those medications are widely used to help reduce cravings to drink, and Vivitrol, of course, is once a month, and the naltrexone pill is once a day. Remember, you cannot make a pickle into a cucumber. My last lecture I talked about, maybe two lectures ago, I talked about how you all are pickles. You can't be a cucumber. You might want to be able to have one or two beers or glasses of wine or a shot of tequila. You're a pickle. Remember that. You can't be a cucumber again. If you can take a pickle and make it into a cucumber, see Dr. Whitsitt after the lecture, we're going to make headlines because you reverse the process. They have tried taking alcoholics and teaching them how to be social drinkers. They've tried that in the 60s and 70s. It didn't work. If it worked, we would spend 30 days with you teaching you how to drink one or two beers. It's been tried. It doesn't work. So you can't make a pickle into a cucumber. Once a pickle, always a pickle. It's OK. Like I said, you're going to leave us a sweet pickle. I like that. That's my dog, Rudy. I still think he has Paul McCartney eyes, but Paul doesn't agree probably. He's awful cute. And my son has dropped off his little dog. He's got a Havanese, cute little thing. Poops everywhere on, in my house, but that's okay. And um, he'll be back on Friday to pick him up because he's on vacation somewhere. But uh, I love my dogs. That was my daughter, my goodness, some 20 some years ago. When I gave this lecture, she fell right asleep. It was a good way to put her to sleep. Any questions by anybody? I've covered a lot of material. I appreciate your time. And if you have questions, uh, shout it out to a staff member or myself later. And I hope you have a good day. Thanks much. And thank you to my video audio engineer. Goodbye.